Thank you ever so much for the warm welcome. I'm really, really happy to be here today. I'm really in awe of the work that's been going on in Scotland over the last few years. And I'm really pleased and proud to be able to contribute a little bit to the work that you're all doing here today and to help you move forward in terms of open educational practice uh, across the country. So I'm going to start by going back in history about 10 years ago, so that's about a million years ago in internet years. Um, and I remember that we had a lot of conversations at the time. So this was at the start of Web 2.0 and social media and social networking services starting to gain traction, numbers starting to increase, indications starting to be made that these were going to be more mainstream phenomena that people perhaps thought a few years before. One of the conversations we had quite a lot was about the very interesting topic of metadata and in particular around uh, folksonomy. So folksonomy being the way that collectives come together to organise and categorise data online. So the conversations around at that time were about well, given that we have a distributed web, given that we have social media, given that these things are gaining traction, this is a really exciting area because we don't have to just look at taxonomies, we don't have to look at centralised divisions and categorisations of information anymore. We can look at how crowds can create and manage and mobilise knowledge. I remember at the time there was lots and lots of conversations about, well, this will never catch on, this is far too geeky, this is far too uh, specialist an area. But it has caught on. It's caught on massively. It's now mainstream. It's now part of everyday life. I'm stalling a little bit because the next slide that I'm going to show you may disturb some of you. And I am aware that once you've seen something, you can't unsee it again. So the people at the back at this point probably in a good position. Uh, if you are, uh, if you have uh, nervous sensibilities, possibly look away now. Okay. So here we go. Hashtag beast man. <coughs> this is that info literature, uh, inf information literature dream of uh, collaborative community uh, tagging an organisation of data made flesh. Perhaps not the future we were all hoping for, but here it is. Hashtags have come from microblogging services where they originally were used to organise, categorise and search for find texts and where they're still very, very popular in terms of Twitter. But they've actually transcended specific online platforms. So you'll see hashtags in blogs, you'll see hashtags in uh, YouTube sites, all kinds of sites. But they've actually walked out of the internet and into real life. Obviously, haven't got a real person modelling this today because that would be a bit too much. Um, you're probably also quite happy to know that this picture isn't shared under open licence. It's uh, all rights reserved. I'm using it under fair uh, trading today. Fair dealing rights today. <coughs> so, socially we change. Socially, we're in a different place than we were in terms of how we use, make use of, engage with technology, and particularly in terms of how we find search, organise, share information. And that's just kind of an everyday thing. Obviously, in terms of educators, that's hugely important because the way that, as educators, we've stepped up to the opportunities of digital, engaging with digital, has had a significant impact on everybody's practice all through levels of, of all through the different levels of education. But what hasn't caught up with that is educational policy. And what that's meant is that we have a lot of educators who are actually not aware or confident around intellectual property issues, particularly around copyright issues. They're perhaps not even aware of intellectual property issues as they relate to their own terms and conditions of employment. I had a learner come to me um, months or so ago and told me a story about a lesson that they were taking part in, a uh, computing studies lesson, 
where they were being taught about the hazards of illegal downloading and the reasons why they shouldn't be uh, illegally downloading films and music. And, um, <coughs> basically, uh, an opportunity for, work, for them to work through the right and wrong of downloading things that were in the copyright without the permission and using them in ways that they haven't got permission. And at the end of uh, the conversation, the practical task that the students were given was to um, create a poster to promote not participating in this illegal activity. And they were directed to do a search on Google, find a nice image and put it in their poster. <laughs> so there's a mismatch in terms of what we want young people to know, what we want educators to know and what we need for daily practice. There's still a, a significant gap there. Okay, so the Scottish Open Education Declaration, I'm really, really pleased to be able to highlight and promote. And I know that there are uh, copies around the event today. It's a really, really important um, piece of work presented by Lorna Campbell in, at the forum in 2014, in fact. And it's a very, very important tool for influencing institutions and policy. So these first three points, point four to six, really get at some of the key benefits and the key reasons why open education and open practice is important, and, and then particularly why it's important to Scotland as a nation. So first of all, education is really, really important. Benefits of education cannot be underestimated. And, and we as educators, and you as a nation, are very, very aware and proud of your, uh, uh, proud of your history and reputation within regard to understanding and promoting education. Secondly, the, key point, the next key point is that education, ex education and access to education can be expanded through open practice and open education. It's a really, really important point. So if we think that education is a good thing and we want more people to have access, then open education is critical to supporting that. And the third point on there is around economic um, benefit. And that's, that is also a really, really key, important point. And a lot of my work focuses on public value. Uh, public value is, is, is an immensely important area for us as a sector. I think there are uh, effects, a huge a range of additional beneficial effects that come from <coughs> those kind of savings of um, <coughs> uh, economics. So for example, the ability for us to work together, to collaborate together, to create new things together. Point seven on the on the declaration really talks about what we're here today for and why. Why events like this are so important and why the role that you play in this community and in your home communities are so key. So the next step forward is to join up these initiatives and develop policy support and guidance to enable the culture shift required to embed open educational practice across all sectors of Scottish education. That's where we need to get to, that's where we want to go, and that's what we're here to talk about today. In broad terms, the shift to open educational practice and away from a, a, a specific focus on open educational resources and open licensing is a really, really welcome one because open education is much more than just licenses, than just resources. However, I would make an argument that we have a lot of work still to do in that area, and a huge amount of work to do. And you can tell how this, this that is, it's particularly within uh, the UK, by something that I can kind of characterise as open blindness amongst educational professionals. So if you talk to somebody who's working within an educational institution, a typical response will be, I don't know what open licenses are, I don't know what Creative Commons is, I don't know um, what OER means. 
one of those things. They're not necessarily going to be confident or knowledgeable about those things. <coughs> However, the Alexia stats show, for example, uh, Wikipedia is the 10th most visited site in the UK. All of their resources are licensed in the CC by SF, so by share alike licenses. And everybody is using that as a resource every day. The number one and the number four sites are both Google, both of which extract data from Wikipedia now and give you that as a kind of headline for your searches as well. So it's not possible to avoid learning something from an open education source unless you use a different uh, search engine, of course, and the alternative search engines are obviously available. Uh, TED videos, which most people have seen, many people don't know that TED videos are openly licensed, but they all are, they're all under um, uh, uh, non-derivative uh, Creative Commons licenses. And TES recently made the move to uh, supporting educators with a choice of open licensing for uploading their free resources. So if you are a, a teacher and you go to TES to upload a resource, you'll be given a choice of one out of three Creative Commons licenses to put your work under. You cannot lodge work with them in their free area without putting it under a Creative Commons license now. So there's been a huge shift, and we're every day engaging with, as uh, information civilians, but also as educators, we're engaging with open knowledge, with openly licensed resources, with open practice. I saw a survey came that was released last night by um, uh, TES Global that talked about three out of four US teachers were saying that they now use OER more than they use textbooks. Now that doesn't surprise me, given what I've just said, that doesn't surprise me what that means is that three out of every four US teachers now know what that means. They now recognise and understand what an open licence is, so that when they're using those resources, they know what the, that those licenses, those, those resources are openly licensed. So I don't think it means that US teachers are using openly licensed resources any more than staff in the UK. But the awareness is different. So it's still, we still have a way to go in terms of what licensing means and it's a still a really, really important conversation. These, I'd say, were the four kind of key fundamental questions that we need to be getting to grips with, with as, as individuals and as organisations and that many people haven't considered. So what does it matter if we're using open licence is obviously the first one. Do we have permission? to use an open license. Can I, as an employee of my organisation, openly license my work? What's the position in terms of that? Is there any kind of formal thing? Am I just working under the radar with respect to that? Does it matter what open license we use? So is it just the fact that we're using an open license and we're openly licensing things, or do the, different, the differences in the different open licences actually matter? And the fourth one there is, do we mat does it matter how we cite openly licensed resources? <coughs> so uh, what you will see is a huge array of uh, citations for openly licensed resources, <coughs> some of which are more kind of satisfactory than others. There's no one right way to uh, openly licensed resources, but obviously by the point that we're getting to, well, how do we cite? How do we kind of do that in a way that's really robust? How do we do that in a way that's consistent? By the time we get to that point, obviously we're in a good place as individuals and as a community as well. But at the moment, we're at number one. We need, us as a community are spread across all of those questions and many of us will have a really good robust answer to all of those questions. But as, a, as, a, as, as countries, we're actually at number one at the moment in terms of educational profession. Okay, so this is the scary open part that could go horribly wrong of this talk today because this part involves you in my keynote and if you don't participate, it's going to be a really long keynote. So I want you to have a look at these questions and I want you to have a think about these questions. 
for a minute. And what I'm going to also do is I'm going to um, tweet out the questions that I'm going to ask you. Uh, although it's going to be trickier getting them from the stream, but we can collect it later on. So the first question then is, what do you do if someone says to you, uh, if an educator says to you, I've never heard of open licences slash OER? Now somebody in the audience is going to have to answer what, what they would say. How would they respond? How would you respond to that? There's no right or wrong answers. I would probably respond in the workplace, I work for jobs in the class, but also in the branch learning framework okay. as well, is ask them a simple question, do you use Google? If so, type it, why don't you type in licenses and find out more? And that gets into the actual work in learning about open learning as well. And obviously we can be people with it, or in bottom up straight away, really happy learning themselves, and then come back with any questions afterwards. So rather than actually telling them what it is, get them to do it, to digital Fantastic. Okay, so the strategy in this case is what we do is we look at the advanced search features of big mainstream, um, big mainstream searches. We look to see what is available as our open licenses there. We also kind of reinforce the fact that you can, you, you're probably already using quite a lot of things, so you, you may not know it, but you are as well. Okay, so question number two. How do you reply when an educator says, I don't see the point in sharing resources openly? What do you say? If an educator comes to you and says, I don't, don't see any point in doing this at all. I think there's a whole argument that publicly funded content should be with the license. Which is why she And that back? <coughs> I completely agree with you. But for somebody also with that, with that ego thing, Actually, now you can also say to them, you know, well, if that's actually what this is a way of building your reputation. Although, actually, you're doing it for the Okay, so question number three How do you reply if somebody says, my resources are not good enough? <coughs> so, an educator saying to you, yes, I've created these resources. You're saying to the educator, you know what, you should openly license those. And they're saying, no, they're not good enough. How do we respond to that? What would you say to people? Suggest to them that this is an opportunity to collaborate with others to make the resources better. Collaborating openly is one way of doing it. It's brave, but it's a good way of improving. Yeah, and I think some people I think we need to recognise that people are human and that they have human insecurities, and we all have insecurities about different things. I think you're absolutely right. It's a fantastic opportunity to put work out and work collaboratively to make it better. I think the other argument from probably an administrative um, point of view is that actually we need to make that work better then, because that work is being talked to our learners, it's supporting our students. If it's not quite good enough to share, then really we need to see how we can improve that as well to support our learners. Okay, so question number four, sorry, question number five. Oh no, question number four, what do you do to the person that says, well actually, my resources are brilliant, they're far too good to put under open license, what are you talking about? I'm not going to give these away for free, you're crazy. What do you say? Seems we said there's <laughs> I would actually ask them, how do you know that that good? If they haven't got feedback from other professionals in there, and if the audience they go to look lovely. Um, and yet the best way to find out if they're any good is to put some of them up on my own source. I get feedback from actual professionals and see what they think. So they might not be that good. <laughs> I mean, there's another argument that if you've been paid by a public body to produce these fantastic best in the world resources, it's actually the public body that's paid you that owns the copyright. If you really want to use them to create external employability, you need to release them openly so you can take them elsewhere. That's a, yeah, a perfect answer. <laughs> a perfect answer. And many educational professionals are not aware of the terms and conditions of their employment. They're not necessarily aware that the default position is if I work for you and I don't have specific permission, the work that I produce for you in the line of that employment, you own the IP of. 
Now, some people, um, and I think it's, it's actually better in the HE sector than it is in the school sector, have that specifically <coughs> noted and pointed out in their terms and conditions in their contracts, but legally, it still holds even if you don't. So it's really important that we actually understand what our um, what, what the position that we're working from is as well. Okay, so next question: What do you reply when an educator says, "I just do what I like, and that's working fine for me"? Getting onto the really tough questions now. So this is a really <laughs> big question because I get and I I get this all the time. Why engage in any of that loveliness? Because I just do what I want, and I've had no problems. My life is my life is great. <laughs> what do you say? Isn't, isn't collaborating and working with other people the only things? People get it all about, but be you like you you collaborate with other people, make your life easier. So you're trying to lure this person in. <laughs> Uh, because they're obviously very self-interested, you're trying to lure them in with with uh, the benefit of working in the community and connecting to others. Any other responses? I would discuss unconscious bias and in social inclusion. Okay. Okay. And uh, discuss that. Get that to choose. Over here. I would actually see that you're just doing it for yourself. You're not doing it for your students. Yeah. You actually need to better yourself for your students. We're all we're all learning the whole time. It's a great point. And I think uh, I think there's two great points there. One, we're all learning all the time. Lots of times when I talk to educators and they reflect on their own practice, they suddenly get quite anxious about the things that they've done previously and how they're going to move forward. But actually, it's fine. Today's a good day to start changing that practice. Every day is a good day to start learning and just doing things differently. And the second point there is obviously about the learners. If I'm standing in front of you, either digitally or physically, and I'm modelling this practice, how is it fair on my learners that I'm modelling bad practice? So there's a whole thing, I think, about professionalisation. There's a whole thing about staff digital literacy and the uh, professional kind of requirements of the job of actually being an educator and the responsibilities around there. Okay, so last question for you. So I want, some, I want a brilliant answer to this one. What do you do if somebody says finding, making and accrediting over <coughs> education is just extra work for me? I'm really, really busy. What you're proposing sounds brilliant in practice, but actually what it means is I've got to do loads more stuff than I'm already doing. And I've got a lot on my plate already. What do you say to that person? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, it's, it's always refreshing to have some defeatists in the audience. It's the only kind of binding that's actual work. I think it's the accrediting that's actual work. Okay. But at the same time, it's, I think, um, it's work. You know, you have to, I think there's an assumption that open is free. And it, it, it is a open costs, a open costs time for people to do it. And I think you have to make people aware of it. You do have to put something into this, but you get so much more back out from that investment, I feel. So that's. I, I so you're not, you're not a defeatist. You're not a defeatist. You think that there's, it's valuable additional. Yeah, it's investment. It's worth making yeah. the extra effort. Yeah. Any other answers? How long do you think it takes to deal with uh, Getty Images IP infringement letter? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good reply. Okay, so my reply, slight, I'll, I'll throw another slightly different reply into the mix there. For me, I think this is kind of at the crux of the, of the question of open practice. So for me, open practice and open education isn't something we do in addition to our work. It's actually core and fundamental to the way that we work, to the practice and the process that we take every day. If you look at the requirements around things that are available to you under regular copyright, <coughs> they actually all require clear accreditation. The terms of your license for your CLA license will say you need to accredit this. 
the terms under your educational exceptions will say you need to accredit your sources. So that's actually something you can't get out of. There are very brief ways of doing good accreditation <coughs> that involve, you know, ten words and a couple of hyperlinks. You can do really, really good, quick accreditation. And you can copy and paste your accreditation from the ones that you've done before to make that process faster. In terms of finding and making, really what we need to be doing is upping our game in terms of practice altogether, rather than seeing that I do this and then I do this in addition. We need to think about how we can change the practice completely. All of these questions are quite personal. We've talked, to them, we've talked about them in, time, in quite personal ways, but these questions go completely for institutions and they go uh, completely for um, organisations and uh, policy level two. There are equivalents to these questions, and these are the kind of key questions that you'll come up against. This is what we want to look at in order to get to that position where we have got the horror that would be hashtag open beast man. <laughs> There's huge benefits of practice. Um, We've covered quite a few of them already in the rumours we've been talking through. These are some of the key ones. Equality of access and accessibility is really, really important. So under most um, typical copyright rules, including exceptions, I can change um, and I can change things for my students with disabilities as long as there isn't a commercially available alternative. What I can't do is I can't change things for everybody. So I can't, for example, have a larger format of something for every student in the room so that I'm not just giving it to one student in my room who has a, a, an issue with using a smaller format. So I am having to differentiate in a way that I'm not, I'm not necessarily wanting to do because of the limitations of the uh, accessibility, flexibility relating to education um, and copyright. Obviously, you're supporting digital literacy. Ensuring public value is something that's close to all of our hearts. Um, promoting and showing excellent work has been mentioned in the room as well. And improving quality. Working together to drive up what we do. And also working publicly to change the focus of how we think about our work. If we're not thinking about our work in terms of, well, what if somebody outside of this classroom saw this piece of work, then what are we doing? Why is that classroom a special case for um, not having an excellent piece of work? So that's kind of the broader social benefits, really. There's also very technical benefits for educators in terms of open practice. So these are David Wiley's open content for ours. And these are things that kind of um, characterise open content, things that you can do with them as educators. Now, against open content, not against open content, alongside open content, because we are generous people, we don't, we, we've got nothing to lose by being generous, alongside open content we've got some great licences within schools, universities, other work organisations to allow us to do some things. So the CLA licence is there, the education <coughs> exceptions are there, and there's fair dealing as well. So we have that range of um, practices to work within. However, we can't, as educators, do a lot of things on that list within those licence requirements. We need open licences to be able to engage with, build on, transform um, <coughs> work to best support our learners and our communities. And there's limitations around um, all of these. So, for example, in terms of remixing, there are some um, exceptions with regard to parody uh, and caricature. So, basically, you can remix things if you're being funny. Otherwise, no, no, you can't within those rules. You need open licences to be able to make those transformative works and to transform the works. So in terms of connecting practice then, this is what we need locally. And this is the kind of route that we've gone down, um, the road we've gone down in Leicester as well. So what we've done is we've put in place policies and permissions, both locally and across the piece that give staff clear permission to openly license their work and send a clear signal <coughs> that actually open licensing is a really positive thing that we're supporting it 
and we would like you to know more about it and to take advantage of that permission. Providing education and support is really, really important. I talked before about the importance of having those conversations about <coughs> licences, licence types, what those things are, those basic things that we still really need to get to grips with, I think, as education communities across the UK. And in terms of that, what we've done is we've created a whole suite of guidance documents, walkthroughs. We've also run, run events, we've run workshops, we've run a range of things. Community development is key, as it is to this community, um, because those are the things that bring about organisational change. So this was a lovely... Um, a lovely post-it comment from one of the staff members that went to our uh, schools conference, which was the first uh, UK schools OER conference. And this, this is really what I wanted from the day. People leaving saying, I know, I know basically now what OER is. And the difference there is that exclamation point. Because if there had been a sad face, we would have failed. But I had an exclamation point at the end of that comment. So not only that I know what OER is, but actually I now consider it to be a reasonably positive thing that I can take advantage of and take forward. We also set up an open schools network, and that helps us to really properly embed that work. And that's really, really important. Connecting communities is really, really important. Our network consists of people from all different roles within schools, all different kinds of schools, and um, schools that serve a range of different pupils as well. They're doing some amazing work. They've been up and running for about eight months now. They're putting in place local policies. They're supporting other staff at primary schools and other schools. They're um, a really amazing bunch of enthusiastic champions who have been given some time to explore this area and to actually take it forward and, and, and have been absolutely fantastic. In terms of connecting practice externally, which is the other thing that we need to do because we need to look out, um, we need to look outwards and we need to look at how we can bring education policy back in line with educational practice and the reality of what's going on. These are the groups that we need to connect to and we need to be having conversations with. So institutional leadership and, and governing bodies obviously are really, really important because they're the people who will be giving you permission, who may own the IP on your thing. So really important to engage in the process. Teaching and subject unions and associations have not been on board enough with this agenda at all. And they're really, really important. We need to do a lot more outreach work with them. Open education and educational technology organisations are obviously key and leading in this area as you are today. And obviously, we also need to engage with and involve local and national government because this is fundamentally a policy issue that we need to take forward in order to ensure that what support is available for educators reflects the support that's actually needed in terms of uh, teaching practice. And that's it. Thanks very much.